Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our October SFU CD public lecture. Before we get started, we respectfully acknowledge that SFU Burnaby is located in unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, including the Tsleil-Waututh, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam Nations, and I'm honored to be joining you from Invermere, BC, on the shared unceded home of the Squamic, the Kiskanook and Tanaha Nation, and the chosen homeland of the Columbia Valley Metis. Since 1989, SFU's Community Economic Development Program, or SFU CED for short, has been the leader in bringing about social, ecological, and economic change. Researchers and practitioners refer to a set of five principles that help differentiate CD from other traditional forms of economic development. And our 120 hour certificate program is focused on developing students' understanding and practices to support them. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Ann Jameson. Ann recently retired from United Way Greater Toronto and now does freelance work in the social enterprise sector. While at United Way, Anne ran the Toronto Enterprise Fund for almost 20 years, where she developed a robust curriculum and set of tools to support the startup stabilization and scale up of employment social enterprises. Among these is the business cost recovery methodology of identifying and separating social costs from business costs and measuring sustainability. And thanks for sharing your knowledge today. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to be talking to you about one of my favorite subjects, which is social enterprise and also the social cost of social enterprise. Um, before I start uh, talking to you about that, I want to I want us to get to know each other. So maybe I could ask you to introduce yourself in the chat, your name, your organization, and we also have a little quick poll um, to just figure out where you're from and uh, what your relationship is to social enterprise. So there's actually two questions here. You have to scroll down um, to see the second question. So please do answer both questions. I'm just curious to see if there's how many folks are on the call who are in outside of British Columbia, but most of you are from British Columbia, which doesn't surprise me. Um, I'm very intrigued to see there's one person from outside of Canada. Um, Okay, and please do make use of the chat as well once you've finished uh, completing the poll. We'll give you another another few seconds to complete the poll and um, let us know, you know where you're situated in terms of social enterprise as well as in the country. And if you're done, I think, I'm not sure if you can, can you, um, Ryan, can you see the results of the poll? Can everybody see the results of the poll? I can. Yep. Yeah, okay, good. So you can see that most of you are from British Columbia and the distribution in terms of, uh, you know, your, your relationship to social enterprise is kind of varied. A lot of other, so maybe if you have time, you could say in the chat, um, what you, oh no, here we go, share results. There we go. So we have the uh, results here. I think it was just the hosts that could see it. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now, but thank you very much for letting me know um, where you are. Uh, I did notice, of course, that a lot of folks were other in terms of their relationship with social, social enterprise. So if you could maybe tell us in the chat um, what, that, uh, what that looks like, that would be great. So thank you very much. Um, I'm, while you're doing that, I'm gonna start uh, talking a little bit about why, why me? Why am I here talking to you about the social costs of social enterprise? Um, and uh, as Ryan mentioned, I ran the Toronto Enterprise Fund for almost 20 years, and that was or is a, um, a funder of employment social enterprises. It is administered or it was administered by United Way Greater of Toronto and still is. Um, it was in partnership with the City of Toronto, the Province of Ontario, and the federal government, but they no longer um, are able to support it. So United, United Way uh, continues to support about a dozen existing ESEs, but um, but the, it's not a partnership anymore. When while we were a partnership, we invested roughly one million a year into employment social enterprises of all different stripes across the GTA, and we uh, funded the startup and operation of over a hundred different employment social enterprises. Because of that, because we were helping social enterprises from the very start, like when they were just, when they were just ideas in, in the minds of either an individual or an organization, all the way up to growing and, and scaling, we found, thought, found it necessary to develop a, a suite of capacity building um, tools and programs. 
and the different products to support those social enterprises. So catalyzing grants was one of our products, startup grants, growth grants, technical assistance grants, all kinds of different grants, even one loan grant hybrid that we put together with Alterna. Um, and, and then during COVID, COVID recovery grants. We also, as Brian mentioned, and you would have seen in my uh, in my bio if you if you read the uh, the promo materials, we developed this uh, methodology, the business cost recovery model, which really helped us to um, to assess whether a, a social enterprise was doing well on the business side and whether it was sustainable. And we developed our own definition of sustainability, which is 100% business cost recovery. A uh, little bit more about myself. I don't want to go into this too much, but I was, you know, manager for 20, almost 20 years. As part of that, I did a lot of um, lobbying of both the federal and the Ontario provincial governments to get some so social cost funding. I can't say that we were super successful, um, but at least we put it on their radar. Um, I am a great uh, supporter of uh, to help, you know, to create an environment in which social enterprises can and I um, helped launch the Canadian Conference on Social Enterprise. I co-founded the Social Enterprise Council of Canada. I was chair at one point of the Ontario Social Economy Roundtable. I helped found the Toronto Community Benefits Network, and I established the Social Purchasing Project, which was helping um, employment social enterprises access uh, purchasing from large in infrastructure projects, publicly funded infrastructure projects here in Ontario. And I spend a lot of time advocating for that as well. Um, so that is why I'm here today to talk to you about social costs, um, account, uh, social costs, the social cost of social enterprise and the business cost recovery methodology. Um, just a little bit about social enterprises and where employment social enterprises are situated in the big ecosystem. I don't want to get into definitions because I know there's no absolute um, agreed upon but 100% uh, and there's different definitions in different parts of the world but we viewed social enterprise when I was at the Toronto Enterprise Fund as a business that is driven by a social mission um, and it exchanges goods and services in the marketplace in order to achieve a social cultural or environmental benefit so the I guess the important factor for me is that the driving force behind a social enterprise is the achievement of the social mission um, and employment social enterprises are purpose built to employ people who face barriers, which are often, uh, which often have been created by some gaps in education, work experience, language, and other issues that folks have that are not accommodated for in the mainstream labor market. So I think it's really important. I run in, have run into this a lot in my career is like people we talk about how the barriers that people face are, are systemic barriers, but then we kind of lay the blame on those folks for, you know, the fact that they're not educated or they don't have a, they have a gap, gap in their education. I think it's really important to understand that the problem is not with the folks. The problem is with uh, the lack of accommodation in the, in the uh, mainstream workforce. Um, so um, as we, uh, we, as I talked about earlier, one of the uh, processes that the Toronto Enterprise Fund went through was to identify the d business costs versus social costs. And I'll, I'll go through an example of how we do that. But let's talk about what the social costs of social enterprises would be. And it doesn't have to be just, um, just employment social enterprises. There are social costs in any kind of social enterprise. Maybe you can think of some examples, and if you can, maybe you can uh, throw those up into the chat for me. And if anybody wants to come off mute, you can stick your hand up. Hopefully I will be able to see that. Um, and we can take you off mute. I'm having trouble, oh, here we go. My chat is, is getting stuck here. Ryan, are you able to see the chat? Oh, wrap, oh, see, this is perfect, okay. Yep, additional workers. So um, often those take the form of job coaches. Sometimes an, an employment social enterprise will staff up in order to um, deal with a productivity gap. And a lot of social enterprises do provide wraparound supports. Um, yep. All of these uh, creating systems, procedures, and equipment 
that um, for people who have um, disabilities or who are disadvantaged. Yeah, absolutely. HR, transportation. Great, these are all fantastic examples. Um, let me tell you what I have on my list. Um, so you are, some of you already mentioned things like tr the job coaching. And in addition to that, social enterprises usually provide uh, training if they're working with um, people who face barriers. They usually provide training over and above what a regular business would, uh, would provide. I mentioned the productivity gaps. So this might require additional materials, a different kind of space. And as somebody mentioned, special equipment. Counseling is another big thing that social enterprises provide. Um, that's part of the wraparound supports, mental health counseling, housing help, conflict resolution. I worked with one social enterprise in Toronto where one of the managers spent a lot of her time on the phone with, uh, with lawyers and police and you know, uh, folks in pr the prison system because a lot of their employees were in conflict with the law. And so they had to do a lot of conflict resolution as part of their work. Food, transportation, clothing, those tend to be, uh, these four first uh, bullet points tend to be associated more with employment social enterprises, but another uh, cost or another social cost could be premium on purchases, particularly for environmentally conscious or environmentally focused social enterprises. They might buy products where they have to pay, um, or materials where they have to pay a premium. Um, premium on distribution costs, again, uh, particularly environmental, uh, social enterprises would want to dis distribute their goods and their services for that matter in the most environmentally conscious way. And so there might be a, pr a premium that they would pay over and above what a business that didn't have that uh, social mission would pay. And then a lot of social enterprises also provide discounts on sales if they're, um, if they're working with a particular, if they're selling to a particular target population or key population, then they may discount their sales and that would be another social cost. Um, not seeing any more in things in the chat, so I'll just keep going. So what are the implications of social costs? Well, from our point of view at the Toronto Enterprise Fund, um, the, the recognition that social enterprises have social costs uh, tells us that social enterprise needs to generate enough revenue from all sources to cover both their business costs and social costs. So they have to generate more revenue to be, um, it, from, as I said, from all sources than a business that didn't have a social mission. Um, in our portfolio, the social enterprises we worked with typically had social costs that averaged 33% of total costs. And those of you who are business-minded know that it is very difficult to generate an operating margin of 33%. Um, the last time I looked, the average in Canada was 12%. So an operating margin is the, is the profit you make after all of your costs, your regular costs, divided by your total business sales. And, um, and as I said, the average in Canada is 12%. There are some very um, specialized uh, industries, businesses that have very little competition and a really niche market that could uh, generate an operating margin of 33%, but generally that is hard to accomplish, which means that social enterprises would require other types of funding that is not business revenue. Um, and, and so that is, you know, why we developed this, or one of the reasons that we developed this was to show to our funders as well as our donors that social enterprises do require ongoing funding, especially employment social enterprises. Um, it, is, it is possible to change the proportion of social costs. You can intentionally increase uh, that proportion. So you can, for example, hire more people who face barriers. You can um, buy products that have a greater premium. You can also intentionally decrease the proportion of social costs. And we have, we have seen that happen in the Toronto Enterprise Fund where a, a social enterprise decided that in order to achieve self-sufficiency, and I'll get to what that looks like uh, later in my presentation, that they would actually reduce the number of people facing barriers that they employed and increase the number of people who don't face barriers so that they reduce their social costs that way and were able to get to closer and closer to self-sufficiency. Um, now we get to the part that some of you are going to go, ah, it's a spreadsheet. <laughs> we, 
Well, at the end of the day, we are talking about money and we are talking about costs. So at the end of the day, it is a calculation that we do in a spreadsheet. This one that you see on the screen is just an abridged version. I'm going to actually show you the entire, the actual workbook that we put together for our social enterprises. Don't get scared. I'm not going to actually walk through it. I'm not going to use it today, um, but it is available if you wanted to look at it. We developed, if you look down at the bottom here, um, let me make sure you can see the bottom here. Um, there's four tabs. So the first one we felt was useful to let people know how to use this workbook. We developed um, a, a series of tabs of sales forecasts, cash flow forecasts, and budget, uh, which are all linked together, which is why um, SFU had some trouble getting it out to you because some of your filters uh, wouldn't uh, let it through. Um, so there's, there's a, a whole spreadsheet here it goes out to 12 months to uh, to do your sales forecast. And then those numbers then feed into the cash flow forecast, which is also a 12 month cash flow forecast, which tries to take into account all of the different um, costs and disbursements that you might have. And then that feeds into a budget um, three year budget, uh, which does require a little bit of manipulation. So what I'm going to take you through today is just that first, um, this first uh, year of budget forecasting to show you how you identify social costs uh, as a percentage of your total costs and how you calculate your business cost recovery. And if there are any questions, just checking the chat again to make sure I haven't missed any. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, if there are any questions, we will have time for questions at the end of my presentation. You can also put them in the chat. Uh, hopefully, my colleagues are, uh, are keeping an eye on the chat as well as me. Um, so I'm just going to jump to a different spreadsheet, which I think is another one that, you, um, that was sent to you. And I'm going to just plug in some numbers here um, that, um, that I prepared ahead of time. So... Uh, very, I've tried to keep it as simple as possible. This is not a real social enterprise, but let's say that we're running a print shop and we're generating $250,000 a year. We consider all of that revenue, uh, sales revenue, as, uh, as business. That's a business revenue. So it all goes into this column here. Um, then we're going to just ignore the second section, the non-operating revenue for now. We're going to come back to that later on. Let's say we have hourly employees. Oh, I thought I had changed this. This is hourly. And hourly employees who are paid 200,000 a year. And they, uh, no, sorry, they're paid 100,000 a year. And they're, oops, my bad. This is, and then 20, an average of 20% in benefits. And then we have, um, sorry, we have 50,000, oops. We have 50, let's say we spend 50,000 on our materials for this social enterprise and then so on and so forth. So I'm just gonna quickly, oh, I'm just gonna quickly, um, I've got so many things open on my desktop that I've gotten lost. Sorry, guys. Just here. Let me just, here we go. And instead of going through the numbers one by one, I'm going to quickly copy what I have. And that will, because it's the individual numbers are less relevant than how we do the calculations. So here we go. Oh, that didn't work. There we go. Okay, so now we have all our costs in this last total column. The important part of this exercise is to figure out what is social and what is business. So we ask you in this uh, spreadsheet to identify what proportion of each expense would be incurred by a commercial business that was not a social enterprise. So let's say, for example, that we have a very, very uh, a workforce that requires a lot of training 
and is also what, what we've identified as a linking enterprise, which means that all of the employees, as soon as they get trained and become good at their job, are graduated from the social enterprise and go to work for somebody else. So we have to start all over again. So 65% only of that total cost would be a business cost. And then the same thing with the benefits. And let's say we are environmentally conscious. And so we do pay a bit of a premium on our, um, on our materials. And so 80% only of those materials are actually what a, a commercial enterprise that was not environmentally conscious would pay. With salaries, this would be something you would have to calculate yourselves, but generally speaking at the Toronto Enterprise Fund, we found that about 50% of staff salaries were business and 50% were social. So 50% of somebody's time would be spent on the counseling, um, the training, the working with the individuals to help them find jobs, for instance. Uh, and that's that's been our kind of, um, rule of thumb is, is the 50%. And then we have um, generally training and employee costs would be considered um, all social. And again, I don't wanna bore you with all the different calculations for each individual one. So I'm just gonna go down and copy in what I have. Um, and so we've I've determined that 65% of rent is also a um, is business and 35% is social because this is a this is a, a workforce that needs a lot of training. So there's some training space. There's extra space in the in the print shop so that people are um, properly accommodated for any of their needs. And so 35% of the cost of rent would be um, social and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not gonna justify every single number here um, because it really depends on the individual business. I just wanted to show you how this worksheet, how this spreadsheet works. Now, what we have is we originally had 391,000 in, in expenses uh, for this business. We've identified that of that 391,000, 155,200 is social and 235,800 is business. And lo and behold, remember, our business revenue was 250. So actually, on the business side, this social enterprise is breaking even. However, on the total social enterprise side, if all it has is revenue of 200, sales revenue of 250,000, it would not be able to cover the entire 391,000 in costs. So it needs <clears throat> a little bit of funding. Um, and that funding is approximately, is not approximately, it's exactly 155200 So that's why I left this until the end. I thought we would go back and put in 50000 from the Toronto Enterprise Fund and 100000 from other funders. And now you have a situation where you actually have a little bit of a surplus, which is always a good thing for a business because you never know what you're going to need. <laughs> money for and you always want to reinvest in your next year's growth so that you can grow and hire more people or if you're not an employment social enterprise you can grow and have a greater environmental or cultural or other social benefit so that's how this spreadsheet works i know there's a few um, sections that i didn't bother with because i thought they would just be confusing normally equipment would be you know probably I didn't put any numbers in, but I would say probably 65 because that's what we had for other things. Renovation, same thing. Um, loan repayment, we'll just leave for now. Um, this spreadsheet, I believe you've received and there was also a link in the chat and maybe we could actually put it back in the chat for people who came late. Because one of the disadvantages of Zoom is that if you, you can only see the chat from the time you arrive. And that is how we calculate business cost recovery. So I'm just gonna go back to my presentation. And I'm sorry if that was really quick for those of you who hate math and hate spreadsheets. But like I said, there this is uh, included in your in the package that was provided to you. And there in the um, in the bigger uh, workbook, there's a, a set of instructions. Let me go back to my presentation if I can find it. Here we go, and oops, sorry, I didn't wanna go right back to the beginning. Here we are. Okay, 
Uh, next is, so I, we talked about how you, oh, you know what? I totally forgot to get to the business class recovery. I apologize. Let me just go back to that spreadsheet and scroll down to here. So this is as a result of this work of splitting out business costs and social costs. We came up with this uh, ratio of sales revenue to business costs. To and one of my um, one of the social enterprise managers started calling it business cost recovery about like fourteen years ago, and so we adopted that phrase and you know started calling this the business cost recovery methodology, and I and started using business cost recovery as a measure of sustainability. Um, so to the Toronto Enterprise Fund, this number was all important. It is the ratio of um, sales revenue divided by business costs. And in this case, it's 106%, which is from our point of view, great. We already talked about the fact that on the business side, this social enterprise is profitable. So any 100% is uh, is the break even, and I'm gonna get to a little bit more of that in a minute. So like I said, business cost recovery is the um, is the calc is the ratio of um, of business cost to if for some reason it keeps defaulting. There we go. Is the so are you seeing the Ryan, can you nod if you're seeing the slide? Yeah, business cost recovery is the calculation of the, oh, sorry, is the ratio of business revenues to business costs. Um, and what's important about this is that it demonstrates whether or not the business, the, the actual sales of goods and services versus the cost of selling those goods and services is making a profit or not making a profit. And, uh, and, it, and from that, we can determine if this social enterprise is sustainable. Because if in the long run, it's not making a profit, then perhaps there's better ways of um, helping the people <clears throat> who are working at it, or there's better ways of achieving the social mission. And it does show if funding is being used for uh, social costs only, or is helping to subsidize the business, which in the long run is probably not um, what a lot of funders would want. A lot of funders would want to just be covering or just be funding the social costs and not subsidizing the business side. So we determine <clears throat> excuse me, 100% business cost recovery equals sustainability. And I did, I created this little graphic that hopefully is helpful in uh, illustrating what how it works. So if you have 100% business cost recovery, if it's equal to that, then you're at business break even, which means your business reven revenues are exactly equal to your business costs and your other funds are equal to your social costs and then you're sustainable. If, however, you your business cost recovery ratio is less than 100%, then your business is making a loss, which means your business revenues are greater than, sorry, are less than your business costs, and your other funds are equal to both social costs and some business costs. On the other hand, if you're on the right-hand side and your business cost recovery is greater than 100%, then you're making a business profit. Your business revenues are greater than your business costs, and that means that your business revenues um, and your other funds, are, some of your business revenues and your other funds are covering your social costs. You might be interested to know what, well, when do you get to self-sufficiency? Um, business cost recovery does not show you when you're self-sufficient. It really depends on what proportion of your social costs are to the total cost of your business. But self-sufficiency is when your business revenue covers all of your costs, business and social. And in the case where if your average um, social costs are 33% of your total costs, then a business cost recovery of 150% would, would be self-sufficient. But that is only in that situation. So we didn't use the business cost recovery to help us to see whether a business was self-sufficient or not. Uh, we did have a number of businesses that did become self-sufficient. And of course, once they're self-sufficient, they didn't need Toronto Enterprise Fund funding anymore. Um, so then we would uh, arrange to, you know, transition them into being um, self-sufficient. What's the utility of business cost recovery and the notion of social costs to funders? Um, we found it extremely useful for helping new social enterprises set a three-year horizon for achieving sustainability. 
So we were able to say, it's okay not to achieve 100% business class recovery in your first three years, but we want to see progress towards it. And then by the end of year three, we hope to see that you are um, at 100% BCR. It allowed us to see the sustainability of our entire portfolio. And if we were putting a lot of subsidy into the business side or none at all, and in fact, for most of the time that I was managing the Toronto Enterprise Fund, our total portfolio business cost recovery was was even over 100%. Um, so that was always really good to see. And it allowed us to show our funding partners and our donors um, how each individual enterprise was progressing, but also how the overall portfolio was, was doing. Um, and so, and then the flip side of all this is that it also allowed us to decide at what point we might stop funding um, a social enterprise that was not making money and was being subsidized year after year after year. And I put a picture of Inspiration Studio here because they were one of the ones that we did stop funding. Fortunately, they were able to survive as a program. They were a good program. We never had any problem with that, but they just were never uh, on the business side making any money. Um, and the Toronto Enterprise Fund felt that we could probably put our dollars into other social enterprises that were making money um, that could have a greater impact. Um, the one thing that's that's really required, and whether you're a social enterprise or a funder, is to stay consistent. So once you've determined your proportions, like your percentages of uh, what's social and what's business, you really need to maintain that consistency year after year. Otherwise, you're comparing you're not comparing like with like. Um, obviously, things can change. Your proportion of uh, of salaries might change if you you know are starting to allocate more more time or your your salaried staff are starting to allocate more time to the business and less time to the social side then you want to reflect that in your uh, in your spreadsheets but really for this metric to be useful it really needs to be consistent year over year uh, that is the end of my presentation uh, I have not been reading any um, any um, of the the uh, questions in the chat, but hopefully uh, I know, back to you, Ryan, I know you've been taking a look at them and I can look at them now as well. Thank you again so much, Anne. Uh, as I was saying, it's no accident this lecture coincides with Social Enterprise World Forum, which is happening in Amsterdam as we speak and with local events coinciding simultaneously around the world. I'm sure we've all gained an understanding on how to identify and calculate the social costs incurred by social enterprises especially employment and training social enterprises. Now that we can determine our business cost recovery or BCR, we can take a different approach to measuring social enterprise sustainability. So the spreadsheets that all attendees will have access to, if you haven't already downloaded them from the chat, please do. You can adapt them for your particular social enterprise organization and community. And this tool is especially useful for CD practitioners attending as they will be able to walk their local organizations through this when social enterprise inevitably come up. So today, and you clearly explained the connections between social enterprise planning and practices that are livelihoods focused, diverse, inclusive, sustainable, place-based, and community controlled, the five principles of CED. And now it's time to open up for the question and answer period. So please raise your hand or type your question in the chat or Q&A box, and we'll read them in order. And I think we already have a question from Matt. Matt, if you want to ask your question, go ahead. Oh, okay, sure. I can turn on my microphone. I was just, you know, I don't run a social enterprise, so maybe I have a different perspective, but I'm just wondering, like, how much of this approach is strictly a communications tool to funders? Um, you know, I think <clears throat> I was talking to a person that ran a social enterprise in Vancouver, um, and she had moved recently to Los Angeles, and she sort of said she thought that, like, in Vancouver in particular, you know, um, the idea is that your revenue covers 100% of your costs, including your social costs. Um, and the atmosphere or the kind of environment in the States, a lot more friendly to kind of the kind of thing you're talking about where uh, there's some philanthropy or some grants that would cover um, more of the costs of running a social enterprise. So I'm sort of wondering how much of this is really sort of an analysis and communication tool strictly to, to funders or to kind of governments um, 
around those, like what those social costs are and, and how much of it's sort of useful to social enterprises and kind of define their own operations and operations costs? So that's a really good question. I, I would say this was not developed as a, a tool just to communicate to funders. It was developed for the social enterprises to be able to look at their business and see whether or not they were running a, um, a sustainable business as a way to employ um, the, the, in our case, it was employment. Um, but I think it's also, um, it's also helpful, I think, for social enterprises to um, use this to determine what, how much they want to invest in the social side of their social enterprise. So I mentioned that you can intentionally increase or decrease the, pro the, the proportion or the, the amount of, of costs that go into, that are on the social side versus the business side, but you can't do that unless you know what they are. Um, so I, I think it's both. I think it's a tool for social enterprises to see how well their business is doing, to determine how much they want to invest in the social side, increase or decrease. And that's also a tool for communicating to funders. Um, I think this situation, like back when I first started uh, working at the Toronto Enterprise Fund, there was a ton of money in Vancouver for social enterprises. Um, we were really jealous <laughs> of the, the situation. I think in the in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of a lot less. Um, you know, a lot of the, the, the big supporters of social enterprises have really uh, stopped uh, providing funding. Uh, we've also seen across the country, it's been a, it's been very challenging for those of us who have been doing this for a long time. It's like we saw the development and rollout of social enterprise strategies by a number of provincial governments, including the Ontario government under Wynne, um, and, and, and then in, uh, in Manitoba as well, there was a little bit of a social enterprise strategy in BC, um, another one in Nova Scotia, and none of those exist anymore. I think there's still something in Nova Scotia. Um, Ontario, it's been gone since 2016. You know, it's like none of those exist anymore. So, um, so I think it's, you know, I, I would like to say that it, this is something you can use for, and so for funders who are maybe not familiar with the social enterprise world, because that, you know, some, some funders will say, well, you're a business, so you should be able to cover all your costs. Um, and I've, I've, I've worked with social enterprises outside of my portfolio that have had that issue and they've taken this model and they've applied it to their social enterprises and then they've showed it to their funders and their funders, you know, will now understand that actually there are social costs that need to be covered and cannot always be covered by the business. Sean, long time no see. Hey, Anne, how are you? I'm good. good. Uh, in part, I just want to join here to see you. Years and years and years. <laughs> it hasn't been I was. And, uh, for everybody else, I'm Sean Schwartz. I'm with Community Impact Real Estate here in Vancouver. I've uh, been operating a number of uh, social enterprises over the years. Currently, uh, in my portfolio is a affordable grocery store in a downtown east side. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the first thing is maybe around a little bit of a history. From the last time I saw your presentation, the social costs were set at 25%. So it's now gone to 33%. Mm -hmm. So what, you know, what, why is that? I think that's just the way the Toronto Enterprise Fund invests in, so was able to invest in social enterprises that were working with more and more uh, folks who face barriers. Um, mm. So at one time, we, as an example, we did not have any social enterprise that worked with people with developmental disabilities. Um, but our, as our portfolio grew and as we were given more license to invest in a variety of different social enterprises, we were able to do uh, to invest in those. Um, and of course, with job coaches and training and a and the uh, level of accommodations that would mm. increase those social costs. So, but there are still some social enterprises in the portfolio that are at twenty five percent. Those tend to be uh, social enterprises that provide permanent employment, so people or well, long term employment. So there's no there's no automatic transition. People leave when they're ready to leave, um, and so those the enterprises like that have less training. Probably don't have a huge amount of job coaching, 
um, they have a very stable workforce and they tend to have lower social costs as a result. Well, that's a really, that's great insight just in terms of typo typology of social enterprise and maybe what can be expected from one mm -hmm. that's looking for permanent employees versus a training one. Mm -hmm. I, I guess my, my follow-up question is around, uh, I guess, the, the type of social enterprise and thinking about I, in your portfolio, is it still like the embedded model that it, that's most popular? And then would that business <clears throat> cost model, would that be associated with uh, kind of like the shared services that the social enterprise is, is being drawn on, is drawing so, on as a result of operating in a maybe larger charity? I would say embedded, but as in embedded in an organization. As That's opposed right. to standalone social enterprise, That's right. I would say yeah. probably about half and half. Um, Toronto, TEF still supports a large number of of organizations, like of, of, of organizations that have that run social enterprises. But but they but we uh, we always had a, a number who were just standalone social enterprises, and I would say that's probably increased in terms of proportion over the years because of the way we. Um, we transitioned our uh, capacity building program to really mm. focus on very early stage social enterprises and to work with both individuals and organizations. So at one time, we didn't work with individuals at all. We only worked with organizations. But as we matured and saw the potential for working with individuals, we started working more with them. Mm. Okay. Uh, sorry, your, the second part of your question, I have forgotten, and I didn't actually understand. Well, to... Sorry, the, the business column, like the business cost column in your spreadsheet, is that where those um, social enterprises that are embedded in a larger organization would drop their costs for, say, accounting, percentage of rent, that type of thing? Yeah, I think... Um... If in the business column, you would see you it should include all the costs of running the social enterprise, even mm. if a social enterprise is embedded. Excuse me a minute, my dog is starting to make. Mm. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> One of the joys of remote uh, presentations, right? Um, so yes, you. So we always encourage social enterprises to cut, include all of their costs, even if they were given on a, a pro bono basis by the parent organization. They should still be included in that spreadsheet, so that the social. If at any, if for some reason at any point the organize the parent organization started charging them or um, wanted to maybe spin them off or. For whatever reason, they needed to show that they could that they could cover all of their costs, not just the the costs that they were actually paying out of pocket. Um, so rent, uh, it, even if they got the rent for free, we would ask them to make sure that they had a rent mm. uh, component in there. Mm. Does that and answer? My last question. It does. Uh, my mm -hmm. last question. I want to leave you to everybody else. Um, is uh, so our 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 small grocery store in downtown East Side. They were, the the mandate is affordability accessibility the affordability mm -hmm. piece is that we're 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 cutting the margin that we mark up on products uh, lower than than what yep. say a convenience store would that yep. differential that that that's actually social lost cost. revenue it's a social cost so how, would... how does that get expressed yeah that's what I'm looking uh for. that's a really good question um I would. I would express it as like an um, an opportunity cost, mm. or the one the other way you could do it, but this gets really complicated, is in your sales revenue, you would include. Yeah, I'm not an accountant, so I don't want to get too in depth in this, but I would definitely have a line item in there that showed the opportunity cost of discounted mm. discounts on sales. I would tend to have, I would tend to show, like, I don't know if you do that, like, if you know what your discount on sales is, if you know what you would charge if we weren't trying to make it affordable, but that would be the best way to show your, you know, your revenue as being what you would have made had you charged uh, competitive prices, and then you have the discount as a, as an expense, um, and mm -hmm. then, and then, or you have, yeah, 
Good question, Sean. I'm going to have Go to give ahead. that Thank you. thought. <laughs> okay. yeah, actually, well, hopefully we actually... we'll see you soon in Toronto. Yeah. We do have an accountant on the line. And so um, Gord Hawley has said that um, it's kind of an in and out, like you would, as as Ann, as you're saying, that there would be the donated costs at the top of the spreadsheet revenue, and then the expense would be captured down below, um, what, whatever the nature of that um, contribution okay. is. Yeah. Perfect. There you go. It's right there in the chat. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Okay. And we've got a couple of questions in the chat. First of all, uh, from Gord, is a template with cash flow and budgets available for download? And that, I believe, is the financial planning worksheets. Can we share that as well? We can absolutely share that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. We'll throw um, that in the chat immediately. Do, do throw that. And then next, uh, from Ruth, uh, are there successful social enterprise models or businesses with detailed, sorry, with details on how revenue and expenses work that could be copied or potentially franchised? Uh... Sorry, I, let me just read that. Yes, yeah. From Ruth Hoffman. Uh, I, I, there are a number of social so successful social enterprises. Um, whether they could be copy or franchised, I don't know. Um, I, I know. Well, Furniture Bank is a is a good example. Um, in Toronto, they and they did look at trying to franchise across the country, but I think they ran into COVID. Um, and, um, so, but if you are interested in that model, um, then I would suggest approaching Furniture Bank and I can definitely provide you with a, with a contact there. Um, Building Up is already kind of a franchise. Building Up is a construction-based social enterprise here in Toronto. They, uh, copied the build model from Manitoba and a number of other, uh, social enterprises have started uh, using that model. Um, so, and in in Vancouver, the Embers is a really successful model. Um, which, if you're not in Vancouver, you could potentially copy or or franchise. Um, so, those are the ones that spring to mind. There are a lot of other social enterprises that could be copied, but are not necessarily financially successful, but they have a huge impact. Eva's Print Shop is one example I, I can think of that, you know, it, I mean, printing is a bit dodgy in this day and age. Um, so it's not necessarily an industry that I would highly recommend, but it had it had some, some or it has some very um, strong social outcomes um, working with youth in Toronto. So yeah, I think there's probably a number of successful social enterprises, Ruth. Um, you you gave me your email, so I can send you a list. <laughs> no, it, it just would be great if there was a, like a book. I, I I had a book a long time ago from Brigham yeah. Young University that yes. listed in a whole, I had several books from them that listed all these uh, small social enterprises with all the yeah. details of the investment yeah. to start up. And it, yeah. it's just great to share. Yeah. yeah, I don't know of a book like that. I know... Um, Mary Ferguson published a book about three or four years ago, well, just before COVID. So maybe uh, I can find that online for you. It's not about copying or franchising, but. Um, yeah, no, yeah. I was being using it's, franchising a, a bit, yeah. you know, tongue in cheek, yeah. but I was yeah. just saying the idea of, you know, why recreate the wheel if someone's done it and says, well, here's the yeah. right yeah. land of uh, social versus business, you know. There you go, Stacy. your next project. <laughs> Uh, Ryan, who else has uh, got a question? We've got a confirmation on the 33% from uh, Stacy. Yeah. yeah. The school did. And then. And Ruth had another question, but I think Michelle had her hand up. Hi, thanks, Sam. Um, and this has been great. I have a question. So I'm a firm believer in the social costing model. Um, and I didn't have language for it before. So I think this is fantastic. But I also have a question about it. So sometimes I hear from social enterprises that um, it's hard for a company, you know, to get a contract, let's say, because mm -hmm. their, their costs are higher. So if it mm -hmm. costs, you know, right, like if it's $10, it's $12 to the social, you know, to bring in that social enterprise. And on the one hand, I could you could use this model and say, actually, they should just charge 10, right? Because that $2 is the social cost and really work at the fundraising and grant development. Now that's a 
choice obviously can make. They might not want to make that choice. But do you think that there's a negative impact to that? Meaning, you know, part of it is them trying to say like, hey, world, there's a responsibility and there's an impact to the choices that you make. So maybe you should spend a little bit more or I don't know. It's just something I'm thinking about. It's a really interesting philosophical problem. Um, I, I would say for most of my career, I encourage social enterprises to be competitive in their pricing um, and to look at, you know, subsidizing the social cost with funding um, from other sources. But, you know, that's that we live in a world where that's very challenging right now. Um, now, I think our, we need to find purchasers who are willing to pay a little bit extra. So the funding is coming from them, <laughs> you know, but they're using their purchasing dollars. And, but I think that's equally difficult. There are some very committed social purchasers in Canada um, that we know about, but they're by no means everywhere. And they're not, they're not necessarily the biggest company in that industry. And so they're not the only, they're not the only purchaser. They're just the one of the few social purchasers in that industry. And I'm thinking of Shandos as an example, right? There's very few construction companies that I've come across. And believe me, I worked with lots of construction companies uh, before I retired. Um, and they did everything they could not to purchase social enterprises. Um, so Shandos, I think, is a very uh, unique example of a company um, in the construction industry. And there are some scattered throughout other industries as well. So I think there's there's a challenge on both sides. So I would say both. We need to, we need to try to pre a, a price competitively and get funding to subsidize the social costs. But we also need to start talking to purchasers about the social cost of running a social enterprise that they should be subsidizing because it has a societal benefit. Now, Anne, did we answer Ruth's question though? Do banks lend to social enterprises? Would they accept the reality that only 67% of costs are covered by operating revenue, knowing that grant funding provides the ability to repay the loan? So the the answer to my to the first question is generally speaking, no, banks don't lend to social enterprises unless they are self-sufficient and they are going to a bank to borrow like any other business. Um Credit unions do uh, lend to social enterprises, and they do understand a little. Well, some credit unions, not all of them, but they do understand the reality um, that some that a percentage of the total cost would be social costs. But I don't know that a bank cares that much about that formula. They care about being about being repaid um, for their, you know, for, that the loan gets repaid and the interest on the loan gets paid. Um, so if you can make a good case uh, for using the money and then re and repaying it, then um, I don't think the bank would care about this particular um, this particular um, calculation. Now, banks, on the other hand, they have a whole you know they all have separate foundations or um, community investment departments that that give grants. That's a whole nother story. Um, then they're they're giving grants, and then they might care a little bit more about this this uh, business cost recovery methodology. And just coming up to four minutes to the top of the hour, I'll say this could be your last question uh, okay. for Matt Dirks. How do you, uh, the Toronto Enterprise Fund, discern when the SROI of a social enterprise had diminishing returns on social benefit as compared to other models of serving those social needs? Was it that thirty three percent threshold? As you say, the types of barriers have an impact on that threshold, but also may mean that other social solutions are expensive. Yeah, I mean, that's such a good question. We saw ourselves as very purposefully investing in businesses that were, you know, becoming sustainable. Um, so no, it wasn't the 33% threshold. That had nothing to do with it. It was the business cost recovery calculation. So our business revenues covering business costs. And if that if that is so far away from 100% and stays so far away from 100% that this is really not a sustainable, it never will be a sustainable business, then perhaps there's a better, a better um, way of supporting the folks that, um, that need the support as instead of running a social enterprise. 
And in many cases, uh, the, uh, the, the social enterprises that we stopped funding, and they weren't that many over the years, but we did stop funding a number. Um, and they did find that reinvesting in a different way of supporting their uh, key population was more successful. Agreed that those can often be more expensive than running a social enterprise, um, but and and it th meant that those organizations had to find funding for those programs in a different in a different space. A lot of them ended up getting funded by United Way, interestingly enough, just through a different pot of money. Okay, well we're at the top of the hour, and I want to thank Anne so much for your wonderful presentation and your great Q&A session.